Hello, everyone. Welcome to the event this evening. Thank you for joining us for Shook. Um, my name is Garrett Arnold, and I am your host tonight. Uh, before we get started, I just want to uh, go over some ground rules, uh, show you a little bit about the event and what we're, uh, you're going to enjoy tonight. Uh, first off, uh, the courtesies of Zoom, hopefully some of you are familiar uh, with this. Uh, please keep your mics muted throughout the event presentation and keep your videos off. Uh, that helps us save bandwidth and increases the, the experience for everyone else uh, viewing the show. Uh, if you do have questions, please feel free to ask them throughout any time of the show. Uh, you'll find the, the chat button you see here at the bottom of your toolbar for Zoom to add uh, questions throughout the event. You can shoot the questions if you want to share them with everyone, just post it in the chat. We have someone uh, monitoring those and uh, putting those online so we can ask them throughout the event or feel free to send them privately and directly to uh, the Mountaineers. Uh, that's one of the co-hosts uh, this evening uh, at the event. Uh, so as you probably saw, this event uh, really was uh, Jen, uh, the author, reached out to me and Dave uh, to put on this event to benefit organizations that focus on uh, benefit the climbing communities here. So it's, before we get started, I want to point out and tell you a little bit about uh, the Juniper Fund, the Alex Lowe Foundation, and the Mountaineers. Uh, so the Juniper Fund was started by the Mountaineers uh, by Mountaineer Dave Morton and Melissa Arno reed in order to address unmet obligations they witnessed through their work as guides in the world's highest mountains. Their work is presently focused on Nepali workers involved in climbing and expedition support in the high mountains of Nepal. Why the mountain climbing expedition industry employs countless local staff and laborers in order to uh, support the adventures of many travelers seek, the reality is that some of these workers are injured or killed in the course of this work. Unfortunately, local governments have inadequate systems for ensuring against this and in the event of tragedy. Many families are lost without a source of income. So really, the Juniper Fund supports these families uh, in their most dire time of need. Um, then the Alex Lowe Foundation. The Alex Lowe uh, Charitable Foundation was established in honor and provide direction and financial support to humanitarian programs in mountain regions around the world. Their work includes the Kumbu Climbing Center for Indigenous People of Nepal. And the Kumbu Climbing Center is a project of the Alex Lowe Charitable Foundation. It teaches Sherpas and all Indigenous Nepalese uh, technical climbing skills via to their safety community. Uh, and they've been doing that for the last 15 years. And then lastly, the Mountaineers, who uh, I work for and I'm representing tonight, uh, the Mountaineers uh, is a nonprofit outdoor community of uh, about 14,000 active members now in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we were founded in 1906, and we've been getting people of all ages outside safely and responsibly for the last 100 years. Uh, we host hundreds of monthly courses, activities, all led by a coalition of volunteers uh, and self support staff such as myself. Uh, we offer ways to get people outside and connect them uh, with others with the natural world. And we think it's important to uh, introduce people to the outdoors early and often and work to protect the outdoor experience for future generations. Uh, we're a volunteer-led nonprofit, and we really just want to connect people and get them outside. So it's really great that like, tonight will benefit uh, these three organizations. Uh, now, the exciting part, I get to introduce uh, Jen and Dave. Uh, who will be hosting tonight during this discussion. Uh, so Jen uh, is, is a writer and teacher. She grew up in New York, graduated cum laude from Cornell University with a bachelor's degree in history, has a master's degree in education. She has caught, taught K through 12 students as well as college freshmen at the University of New Mexico. And she lives in New Mexico with her husband, twin sons, and Cocker Spaniel. Uh, and she's also staying up a little later because she's in mountain time. So we've got to thank her for that, too, uh, being at 8 o'clock tonight, starting out. Uh, then Dave, uh, our main character for Inshook, has uh, spent 35 years uh, guiding high, cold, remote mountains. Uh, he has quite the resume. He has reached the summit of Everest 15 times more than any other non-Sherpa climber. He's guided climbers to the summit of Mount Rainier. Uh, now 300 times and has led 24 attempts on Denali, reaching the summit 21 times. Uh, Dave has reached the summit of the Vincent Massif in Antarctica thir oh, 38 times. And in 2006, Dave guided a team of professional athletes on an expedition to ski Mount Everest, if that was enough just to climb it. Uh, and then in 99, Dave participated in an expedition that discovered and identified the remains of explorer George Mallory. 
who died trying to scale Everest in 1924. Uh, Dave has been on seven expeditions to the island of South Georgia and has led trekkers overland on the Shackleton Traverse, which in 2004 won Outside Magazine's Trip of the Year Award. Uh, he's participated in many visits by ship to the Antarctic Peninsula, and as Dave has shot high altitude video for PBS Nova program, Lost on Everest. Um, in the summers, uh, he bases, uh, bases on Mount Rainier and guides regularly on Denali, Kilimanjaro, and the Vincent Massif. He's a longtime ski patroller, uh, and he lives in Taos, New Mexico. So he's nice and toasty compared to us, maybe up in the Pacific Northwest, getting rained on lately. Uh, so this evening really is uh, a really discussion about the experience in the book that, uh, that is Shook. Uh, so I'll be leading uh, a lot of questions and answers and a discussion with Dave and Jen. Uh, but it's, it's really, uh, encour I'm encouraging you all to participate, put your questions in the chat, uh, be a part of the discussion uh, of this important subject. Um, before we get started, though, in the discussion, I invite Jen. Uh, she'd like to read the first chapter of Shook to kind of get us started and introduced to the evening. Uh, Jen, if you want to take over, turn on your screen and mic. OK, does that work? I hear you. Great. Thank you, Garrett. Thanks for having us. Such a privilege to be here. Um, and thank you also to Christine Haas at the Juniper Fund and Jennifer Lowe Anchor um, with the Kumbu Climbing Center, which is, of course, sponsored by the Alex Lowe Charitable Foundation and um, Dave, without whom none of this would be possible. So thank you for having us. Uh, this is chapter one of Shook. Um, it's called Camp One Everest. And it begins with an excerpt uh, from the New York Times from April 25th, 2015. More than 25 million years ago, India, once a separate island on a quickly sliding piece of the Earth's crust, crashed into Asia. The two land masses are still colliding, pushed together at a speed of 1.5 to 2 inches a year. The forces have pushed up the highest mountains in the world in the Himalayas. In the vast bowl of the Valley of Silence, four canary yellow tents sat in a row, perched on a narrow fin of glacier like birds on a wire. Dave Hahn, the lead guide of the 2015 RMI Everest Expedition, and his assistant guide, JJ Chessman, were in the second tent. Beside them, clients Robbie Massey and Peter Rogers shared the first tent. On their other side, Sherpa Sirdar, cheering Dorje, and client, Hamanshu Parwani, HP, as he liked to be called, listened to tinny Nepali music playing from an iPhone in the third tent. Clients Haolu and Hans Hilscher occupied the tent on the end. They had just crawled wearily inside of their nylon shelters, their heads throbbing from the oxygen deprivation hangovers of their first night at 19,689 foot camp one and thirsty and exhausted from their successful morning rotation to 21,000 foot camp two. Moments earlier, they had crossed quivering metal ladders over deep crevasses, scraping their crampons on the frozen metal as their gloved hands clutched thin ropes on either side. It was 11.56 a.m. on April 25th, 2015. Dave was wiggling out of his climbing harness and JJ was bent over a camp stove melting snow to make tea when they felt the ground move in waves below them. Dave froze. At nearly 20,000 feet on Everest, he suddenly felt like he was in a boat on the ocean. He and JJ glanced at each other and at the same time said, earthquake. All eight of the climbers instinctively shot their heads out of their four tents, but sucked in by the weather. They could see nothing but snow falling in a dense gray fog as the ground below them rocked. What is this, Dave? What's going on? Is this normal? Shouted HP from his tent. Then above them, they heard a roar of cracking ice. Avalanches began to rumble downward, echoing in the bowl between the mountains that amplified sound like an amphitheater. The ground jolted and dropped. In the first tent, Robbie Massey remembered what he had said to his family when they expressed concern about the 2014 icefall avalanche. Lightning doesn't strike twice, he had told them. Oh my God, JJ blurted. 
Dave took a mental inventory of the situation. Mount Everest was shaking like jello. He and his team were camped between two crevasses and below 3,000 foot high towers of ice. Avalanches thundered down every mountainside around them. He found himself considering whether it would feel better to die from an avalanche off the peak of Nupsi or one off of Everest's west shoulder. During those brief seconds of assessment, which stretched out in slow motion, he also took stock of the possibilities that the ice shelf on which they were camped could collapse out from under them or could break loose and slide 3,000 feet down into the ice fall. It's an earthquake, he heard himself shout, but we're all right. Zip up your tents and stay inside them, cheering instructed. Get your helmets and transceivers on. The bewildered team obeyed, sliding on their helmets and strapping on their transceivers as they stared wide-eyed at their tent mates. HP's hands trembled while he set his beacon to transmit mode. The roar of snow and ice grew louder and closer. Robbie and Peter grappled with tent zippers flapping wildly in the wind as they contemplated their own deaths. Cheering thought of his wife, pregnant with their first child. The ground below them shook violently, swaying and popping before they could manage to zip all their tent flaps and vent shut, they were hit. Thank you, Jen, for sharing that. Uh, so, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for teaming up with Dave to tell this amazing story. Like I'd like to kick off uh, this evening with my first question. Um, Jen, can you share why did you feel the story was important to tell and share with the audience? Like there's stacks of books have been written about expedition and climbs of Everest. Uh, what stood out to you uh, in store with the 2015 earthquake? Yeah. Um, you know, when the 2015 earthquake happened, I got one of those Facebook messages. Um, it was one of the first of its kind um, that said, you know, Dave Hahn marked himself safe in the Nepal earthquake. And um, it, it felt to me at that point like the end of a particular era. I had been watching Dave's career for at least 20 years. I taught, um, I taught middle school at Taos, in, in Taos, at Taos Middle School in a portable classroom sitting in a parking lot. And uh, Dave wasn't often in town, but when he was, he would stop by and uh, give slideshows to my students. He brought, you mentioned earlier, the Mallory and Irvine expedition, and he brought this book, The Ghosts of Everest, with him and um, inscribed it to my students for a class of kids whose true class thanks for keeping track of us. And that was back in 2020. So I think that's when the idea was planted. Um, I really wanted a narrative nonfiction vehicle for my students to sort of support the curriculum that I designed around his visits. But it was that combined with a lot of, you know, 20 years of other things. And when, uh, when the earthquake happened, it just felt to me like a story that needed to be told and um you know of course dave is a wonderful writer and i thought maybe it would be time for him to write his book but he at that time had no intentions of doing so we met for breakfast and talked about it and uh it took me a while to convince myself that i had any right to try to tell this story from the perspective of a total outsider to the mountaineering community um, but again, I felt like it was an important story to be told for several reasons, not the least of which was to try to celebrate Dave's career, which had become so consequential over those decades. Um, but also, I think the story appealed to me on a metaphorical level, and uh, I just kind of wanted to hear what it had to say, mm -hmm. the story itself. Mm -hmm. And did the story, when you started out, did it change? Uh, did, did the story change of what you thought it was going to be? You know, you set out to tell someone's story in one narrative yeah. and you end up finding another like tendril and another question and another answer. Did you right. have that experience along the way with this book? Well, like I had to just, I mean, the story happened, it happened in real life. So I had to decide where to enter it and where to exit it and, and, and where to follow it. And, uh, 
I, I really, I, I didn't have much that I intended to tell in the story. I just came, became kind of obsessed with what had happened and really was just driven by curiosity what I was going to learn from the story as I dove into it and began researching it. So I was more curious than anything and just wanted to be a really accurate observer of what I heard and saw and let the story sort of speak to me um, in a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and Dave, what was it like to have someone tell that story for you? You were a storyteller yourself. What was that process like to, um, you know, to, to share that part of it? Well, it was uh, it was a little interesting because uh, Jen definitely told a a different story than than I would have told. I I guess I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have chosen that particular trip to uh, to write a book about. For me personally. It, it, you know, I didn't, I didn't see it as a, as a story. And now that, now that Jen wrote it, uh, of course I do. And, mm -hmm. you know, people's comments that have, that have read the book, uh, they love the story. But yeah, to me, it was, it was uh, an abbreviated expedition. You know, we, we didn't get to the part of the, the Everest climb that I, that I really like, <laughs> you know, yeah. since the trip was cut short. So, so as I say, it, it wouldn't have been my natural inclination uh, to tell that story. And I, I appreciated that, that Jen was telling it, but I also told her, you know, you're going to have to really be into this because because I'm not all that into it and I'm going to be doing, <laughs> I'm going to be doing my thing and mm -hmm. I'm still going to be, you know, climbing and guiding. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to, to, you know, push me for answers and, uh, and follow-ups. And I'm glad she did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now going, going to like on the ground on Everest, uh, recent years have seen record numbers of climbers attempting Everest. We've seen the pictures of conga lines and uh, bottlenecks. Um, how are guides, clients, and governments managing this uh, increasing human impact? Uh, Dave, you bring up a lot about human waste on the mountain. And how, how is that being balanced with this interest and desire to, to you know, summit Everest and uh, be a part of that side of the mountaineering community? Yeah, it's, it's a problem for sure. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it's a problem that, that got a lot worse over the years that I was going to Everest. I started going to Everest in 1991, uh, went 24 times through 2015. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I can't stand completely on the sidelines and say, wow, that, that crowd, that's a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. Because of course, some of that's my fault. You know, I, I made a big part of my career leading commercial expeditions on Everest and, and writing about them and making films about them and, you know, taking pictures and showing people so the fact that it it got more and more popular, um, yeah, I, I share a little bit of responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. That said, yeah, at a certain point, it I I think the crowding did get out of control. And for years I, I was defending the industry and and saying, you know, that well you know, you just have to be careful around these crowds. And, you know, the fact that some people are polluting the mountain and being there irresponsibly doesn't mean that we're all doing that. You know, some of us were trying to be very conscientious about our impact on the mountain. Mm 
Mm -hmm. But altogether, sure, we we do have this impact on a fragile environment. You know, mm -hmm. there's 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 no number of people can go there without having some impact on on that fragile environment. Um, you know, there are there are still good guides that are there that are working very hard to to minimize their impact. Uh, I think it's sometimes a little bit unrealistic in the West here, you know, hoping for the Nepal government to be able to solve the problems and regulate the crowds and regulate the uh, or restrict the uh, pollution mm -hmm. on the mountain. I mean, Nepal has extremely serious problems uh, everywhere else in the country, including the places where people live. So, so asking them to be expert at regulating this, this wild environment, you know, they, they try, but, but it's difficult. Uh, you know, oftentimes new laws to deal with pollution turn out to be other avenues for corruption. Mm -hmm. And you know, don't don't necessarily solve solve the problem. Just adding more and more laws. But uh, you know, take the the present moment. You know, where where Nepal's economy is being decimated by the coronavirus and the lack of tourism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's really doubtful that that when tourism returns and Everest climbing resumes, it's really really hard to believe that they'll be able to turn away any of that revenue. Mm. So I, I'm afraid I don't see that crowding uh, getting better. Mm -hmm. So since, since the earthquake happened on that note, has your approach to big mountain expositions changed at all? Uh, and do, do you prepare for it differently uh, in, uh, in any way when you're going to Everest, now that that's in your head? Well, that 2015, the earthquake, that turned out to be my last Everest expedition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when Jen was writing her book and we were talking about this, it still wasn't a done deal for me. And, you know, and I was, was puzzling over it for a couple of seasons there. It had been so long since I hadn't or since I had missed a season mm -hmm. in the Himalaya. But, uh, but 2015, coming on the heels of the disaster in 2014, the avalanche into the ice fall that, that killed 16 Nepalis. Uh, the year before that, 2013, I got to the summit, but it, it wasn't a very, it wasn't an enjoyable season. It was a hard one. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so my last last few years there were were tough and dangerous and involved kind of a lot of death. So I, as it turned out, uh, you know, like I say, I, I didn't know it at the time, but I was done guiding Everest. Mm -hmm. And now five years later, I'm I'm comfortable with that. I I, I still have still have that little bit of an itch that I'd like to go climb Mount Everest again, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm resisting that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm still guiding Denali. I'm still guiding Rainier. I'm still guiding down in Antarctica, Kilimanjaro. I'm still in the mountains every day. And, uh, you know, the it, it'd be nice to think that because I'm done with Everest, I'm done with, with uh, that level of hazard, but uh, no, it, it, it still exists. It's just everything is amplified on Everest. Yeah, I wanna take a, a step back and, and bring Jen back in. Jen, can you just summarize uh, what that day was like and the impacts of the avalanche on Camp One, on base camp uh, and the surrounding communities? Well, I mean, it was certainly, devastating to Nepal and, and to all of the surrounding communities. Um, it, it was shocking, I think, particularly 
at Everest because the impact was felt so profoundly at base camp, mm -hmm. which is typically the command center for all of these expeditions. So Dave and his team were up at camp one. And I, you know, I found that particularly an interesting part of the story that base camp where, um, Mark Tucker was and where Larry Seaton was from the expedition um, would, would typically be able to help, would be focused on helping them. Right. Um, and instead, they were surrounded by grief and destruction and, and had to change their, everybody's priorities had to change really, really quickly. And, and that's where I thought all of those years of experience um, really paid off and, and probably why I found even though this was a very sad expedition as what had the, been the previous season I think I thought that it sort of celebrated Dave's career the most and that it was sort of the culmination of all that experience that allowed them to cope with this totally unexpected disaster where they were uh, where, where base camp couldn't help and mm -hmm. they were stuck at camp one trying to figure out how to get close to 200 people back down the mountain when the ice fall had been destroyed but in in the surrounding villages like i think cheering is a really good example um sort of typifies what people were experiencing in the kumbu valley nobody knew who was alive and who was dead and he was cut off from all contact with his the village where his mother lived for instance from his pregnant wife um it was very terrifying um, for all the Sherpas, I'm sure, you know, who, who didn't know whether how their families were doing in, in Kathmandu or in, in the tinier villages around them. And um, Christine Haas, who we mentioned earlier, is the, I think she's the executive director of the Juniper Fund, said that the mm -hmm. Juniper Fund is actually, she told me that they're actually um, supporting 11 families wow. who lost Nepalese, you know, workers, Sherpas. Uh, as a result of the earthquake that day. So a lot of um, Sherpa's families are dependent on that income, not just for their own immediate family, but for extended family. So I think it also highlights the importance of these organizations like um, the Juniper Fund or, or like the Kumbu Climbing Center, you know, which is sponsored by the Alex Lowe Foundation in terms of, of, of giving uh, these Sherpas who are working, you know, Sherpa is an ethnic designation and it's also a job description. So when you're talking about Sherpas being, you know, existing on, in, in terms of the job description, existing on a spectrum between a high altitude porter and a very technical mountain guide, cheering from the story, as you know, uh, he hadn't planned on being a Sherpa in his childhood. He had hoped to be a computer software engineer or a doctor and um, his first summit on Everest was as a kitchen boy in a Japanese expedition uh, for which he had zero climbing uh, instruction, you know, no technical instruction whatsoever. So I think it also highlights the importance of organizations like the Alex Lowe Foundation in supporting something like the Kumbu, Kumbu Climbing Center and giving um, Sherpa is this kind of technical instruction that's so vital in these extreme situations. Yeah, I really like in the book where you highlight that there's so many people being activated to help the effort, to help people get from Camp 1 to support base camp. Yeah. Uh, the guides, the Sherpas, the clients, this iconic picture of the helicopter pilot uh, that's, and that was taken, I feel like I have to mention that that take the picture, which is so extraordinary, I think, was taken by Robbie Massey, who was a client on the expedition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think, uh, Dave, you can talk a little bit about that, like the team effort and the rallying of everyone to make the decision, get through the Kumbu icefall, or uh, have helicopter pilots like evacuating people systematically like that, that kind of organized effort and that kind of chaos is really just amazing. Yeah, well, it, it was kind of an evolving process. Um, you know, after, after the 
earth quit shaking, you know, I, I mean, we had avalanches coming at us from both sides and, you know, they, they stopped short. We got shook by the, the wind from those avalanches, but we were just, we were, we were just fine mm -hmm. and, and unaware of, uh, of the tragedy down below at base camp. But initially, but the, you know, immediately, you know, you started thinking and it was like, well, how could the, how could the route through the Kumbu Icefall possibly have survived that earthquake? You know, I, I mean, chunks of the climbing route through the Kumbu were always falling out even without earthquakes. So, you know, we had to assume that, that the route down didn't exist at first, but I know getting together with the other team leaders that were up there and Sherpa team leaders at Camp One, you know, we all, we all felt like, hey, we're in control of this situation. Uh, we'll just, you know, it's going to take some work, but we'll rebuild that route down through mm -hmm. there. It's not it's not like we came up with only one day of food or fuel. We've, we've got provisions up here. Um, we can, we can do this and we'll rebuild the route. The next day, uh, as Jen details in the book, we came up with a plan between the different teams to scout the damage from above and scout the damage from below to the icefall route. And sure enough, you know, both those efforts found that the route was imp impassable, but more significant, while they were looking, there was a massive aftershock. And that, that kind of made it clear to us, to all of us, that, that our plan was flawed. We couldn't, we couldn't send people back into the, into the icefall to work on the route, you know, you couldn't be under those towers of ice if the earth was going to keep shaking. We didn't plan on the, on the aftershocks. And so, you know, the, a, a further day of that, and we all got together again up at Camp One, and it, you know, I think, I think for many of us guides, it, it kind of felt it was an uncomfortable feeling because it was like, well, you know, I could, I think I could get through if it's just my team, I think I could, you know, it, it'd be really dangerous. It'd be really hard, but I think we could find a, a way down and through, mm -hmm. but I definitely didn't feel like I could like produce a route that worked for whatever it was, 140 or 200 people. So, you know, we kind of came to this, it was a pretty uncomfortable realization that we needed rescue. You know, we needed to get out the credit cards and start waving them and get all those, those helicopters. And, you know, that picture of a B3, well, luckily that, that tool had come to Nepal a few years before because uh, until then the helicopters weren't capable of, of coming up to uh, to camp one with any kind of control and uh, yeah that you know uh, that little fleet of private helicopters in Nepal made all the difference for us mm -hmm. but of course it it we were aware that Nepal as a nation was suffering this disaster right then we were aware that the helicopters were going to be coming where the money was, you know, to get us out of camp one and that the rest of the country needed helicopters as well. But we, it wasn't like we had the luxury of, of waiting a week or two weeks and then, and then getting a rescue. So, you know, if there's a silver lining to it, I'd like to think that, that us paying for rescue, uh, from the Western Coombe in 21 or 20,000 feet that hopefully that subsidized the,
the, the rescue work that they did in the villages of Nepal in subsequent days. Mm -hmm. And this is a follow-up from one of our uh, audience members. How did the clients on the climb um, respond to the book? And looking back on this five years ago, how, how have they, have you maintained a relationship and been in touch with them about that decision that day? Me yeah. or Jen? Or either or. Jen, you've probably had more, more and more regular contact with them. I, I, there's, Certainly, in my mind, there's no animosity right. uh, between me and my climbers, but I, I, no, I don't no, always do the, the best yeah, job yeah. of staying in touch. No yeah. animosity. I mean, they all speak incredibly highly of Dave. And I think Larry's here maybe tonight. And um, I don't know if Erin came. I saw that she was interested. Um, no, I think there was, I mean, it was certainly an emotional experience for a lot of, for, for them. But uh, I think they were very grateful and they felt like they were in the best of hands. Uh, and, you know, some have expressed some PTSD from the event, but um, overall, you know, they, they were just incredibly grateful. Mm -hmm. And when you're reaching out to these climbers or working with Dave, what was it like as an outsider from in the mountaineering community? To well, for me, it was just a real absolute privilege to be able to enter this community um, in the way I did from the outside. I never could have done that if it hadn't been for Dave. And whenever Dave would put me in touch with someone, they would really graciously oblige because it was coming from him. And uh, this was, it was a wonderful group of people who he had as his clients that um, season. And it, it's been a real gift getting to know all of them more personally through this process. Mm -hmm. And how did, how did you research this to get ready for the project and stuff? What, what was that process? A lot of, um, it was a lot, a lot of research of all kinds. Uh, the pri uh, primarily interviews of everyone involved, um, all the clients, all of the, um, you know, JJ, the assistant guy cheering. Cheering was an incredibly valuable resource and really readily available all the time. I interviewed Dave, obviously. I used about 20 years of blog posts that Dave has written. I don't think there's really anything online that Dave has written or said that I haven't seen. I'd be surprised if there's something I haven't seen. Um, I, uh, My sympathy. <laughs> well, um, I, I'll call you from, I'm looking at my books, Pile. I'll call you from Kathmandu, which was published by you guys, by the Mountaineers. Um, Bernadette McDonald's book was great. I, and I had the privilege of interviewing Miss Holly via Billy Beerling. Um, yeah, so tons of outside magazine was an amazing resource. Um, you, in our communications, Garrett, you mentioned, you know, there's statistics about the danger of um, yes. being a Sherpa and um, it was so cool how they came up with those statistics. What they did was they compared the data from Miss Himalaya, I mean, from Miss Holly's Himalayan database, um, you know, because she recorded everything. And so there were many, 50 years of statistics on, on Sherpa deaths on Everest. And they, they aligned that with year, the statistics from the U.S. Bureau of Labor mm -hmm. between the years 2000 and 2010. Um, and they came, that's how they came up with, you know, those comparisons that being a Sherpa on Everest was actually, you know, three times more dangerous than being a U.S. soldier in Iraq in combat. Um, and that was really, that was just between 2000 and 2010. And, and obviously it's been deadlier seasons ever since. So those statistics are even greater, but out, outside magazine, um, Grace and Schaefer, I mean, there's so, I, I don't want to start naming people at outside magazine because there's been so many great articles, uh, written by them about Everest. Um, so yeah, just all kinds of research, uh, years of research. Yeah. There was actually a picture too that we had there of one of the Sherpas and the sacrifice of carrying some of the stuff so you can find oh, it. Oh yeah, that's that's Larry Seaton's photo, the one with the um carrying the 
Exactly. Think, that was in the pre-show slide. Yeah, yeah. That Larry took that photo and, you know, he works um, in construction in Napa Valley, California. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was just shocked to see, you know, the loads that these Sherpas were carrying because every stick, stone, every element of every bridge in the Kumbu Valley is actually carried in, you know, since there are no roads. To, sorry to clarify. Yeah, no, go. Uh, just the the picture was of a of a porter. Oftentimes, those aren't Sherpas. Right. The the Sherpas kind of yeah. reserve their carrying for for in the mountains. They protect their brand that way, and yeah. so it's often kind of uh, people from lower down valleys, uh, lowland Nepalis that are that are coming in for that work mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that guy carrying timbers on the way up the Tangboche Hill, that, you know, we calculated that at about a 200 pound load. So work, I mean, work on Everest is, is really dangerous. Uh, it is hard and, but, but yeah, you've set it against the perfect backdrop. There's not, there's not easy ways to make a living in Nepal, uh, not on Everest, you know, it, it, it's an extremely tough work environment uh, in general. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that doesn't excuse that, that uh, Sherpas are at, are at so much risk for our, you know, recreational enterprise. But, uh, you know, I, I submit that that there's a responsible way to employ people in dangerous jobs and there, there are irresponsible ways. Exploitation definitely goes on, but, uh, but I, I don't think that, you know, just giving somebody uh, dangerous work doesn't, doesn't necessarily, well, it's, it's not inherently bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Since since a lot of the work that I do is is inherently dangerous in other places. <laughs> and, and Dave, can a little bit about your your guiding experience in life? Can you in the book you uh, briefly mention about how you commit half your brain to the risks and hazards, uh, and then the other half to kind of the playgrounds of the mountains? Uh, what's your mindset during guided climbs versus kind of personal and private climbs with that? risk playfulness dynamic that you have yeah that's a good one uh a lot of people would tell you i only had half a brain anyway so <laughs> you know the fact that i was proportioning it that way would come as news to them um you know i uh i i think i've i think i tend to stay a little bit more scared in the mountains than than some of the some of the other climbers that I know, mm -hmm. um, and and I should point out that that the reality, you know, I'm I'm 59 years old. There was a time where I thought, you know, I was more of a climber than a guide. Well, it turned out I'm more of a guide than a climber. I I don't get out after after personal climbing goals uh, very often at all, and. And when I do, <laughs> my mindset is usually terrified. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, that served me well. It's, it's kept me alive. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, I guess it's a, it's a tendency that I have from guiding to constantly be looking at what's wrong with this, what's wrong with this picture how can we get in trouble here, you know, when everything seems like it's going well? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if, if you think that way in all your personal climbing, you don't get a whole lot done. You know, the, the great, the truly great climbers that I've known, they don't, they don't spend nearly as much time as I do worrying about what could go wrong. They focus on on getting the job done and visualizing success. And I think that's important for the level that they're climbing at. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I drag my years of guiding into my personal climbing. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
uh, in a, a follow up, one of our audience members has a question about uh, with earthquake safety in mind, specifically like in, in Seattle, you know, we talk a lot about the, the big one, if Earth, uh, Mount Rainier uh, blows or we get more earthquakes here in the uh, ring of fire. Uh, have you changed your approach or the mitigating risk if, if per se you were climbing Mount Rainier with an earthquake in mind? Uh, it's, that's pretty hard to do. I have been on Mount Rainier for earthquakes. <laughs> uh, but never, never a severe one. Uh, but it, it, it is a tough thing. Even the the normal standard route that we guide on Mount Rainier, where we're under towers of ice, we've got right. our own version of the Kumbu Icefall, the Ingram Icefall, that we that we go under. We we're under crumbling rock ridges, so. Uh, you, you can't climb a mountain like Mount Rainier without, without putting yourself at risk from the things above you. And mm -hmm. you're, you do well to keep, keep track of, you know, how much time you're under things, but, but you're never going to avoid completely being under things. Mm -hmm. Same, same on Denali. I mean, once, once you're up and on the mountain, wow, you've, you know, if you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, like we talked about, we, we always thought Everest Base Camp was safe, but, but right. it, wasn't, it wasn't absolutely safe. You know, if that, that avalanche came off of Pumori, and it's like, well, yeah, after that happened, you could see that sure, it would channel this way and it would hit base camp with this force. But yeah, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake, I mean, we're lucky the whole mountain itself didn't fall down. You yeah. know, all bets are off, you know, when you're in the high Himalaya or the high mountains mm. and, and that, big a, that big an event happens. So... Yeah, it definitely did change the way I looked at, at some of the mountains that I was climbing for a while after the earthquake. But, uh, but no, the, there's, there's not a safe way to, to you, you're already trying not to expose your camps to avalanche hazard. Mm -hmm. but, has, has base camp been moved since then? No, it, it hasn't. Um, again, I, you know, it's uh, it's in. I mean, the you know that that avalanche in 2015 took out the middle third of base camp. Base camp being kind of in a, a mile long strip, and it blew out the middle third of that. But I hate to say it, but people that thought that they were well placed in that one, and we were just on the edge of the destruction, the upper edge of the destruction with our camp. But you know, the next the next time a mountain falls, or you know that there's a a gigantic earthquake, maybe it's the upper third or the lower third. Mm -hmm. We're we're already in the safest place. We can be there, but it doesn't, there's no, there's no totally safe place to be. Sure, sure. Uh, this question's for both of you with uh, a lot of conversations are really getting going uh, with climate change in the mountaineering community. Um, Jen, in your research uh, with other climbers and stuff, what's been the discussion of the future, in, future of mountaineering? Uh, same to Dave, if you see up and coming new guides uh, how are they approaching, you know, if a glacier's receding, are new routes opening up or they're going to have to just completely write off uh, a route because the glacier no longer exists there? Is that, yeah. Well, I well, think that has. Jen first. I'm like, sorry, were you asking Jen first? <laughs> yeah, no, Jen first on that one. It was a long-winded question. <laughs> Go, Jen. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, it seems clear that the temperatures are warming and Dave had witnessed a lot of change while he was in the Kumbu. However, he's been really clear in saying that, you know, climbing in Everest is inherently 
dangerous and it always has been and it always will be regardless of you know what climate change does to the mountain what what i find interesting is how the watershed impacts the communities in the kumbu and, and even you know through, throughout greater nepal the the kumbu valley communities rely on the glacier melt um, for most of their domestic water use and I think global warming is going to be changing that. Um, there's a group, of, I'm, it's like Geoscientists Without Borders, I think it's called Geophysicists Without Borders, and they're, they're trying to come up with ways to store the water in the Kumbu because depending on what season it is, you know, maybe the water won't be as reliable as it was in in the past. So, so I'm interested not just in how it's going to impact, you know, the cl the climbing seasons and the reality of, of climbing in the Kumbu, but also how um, it's just impacting water shed in general. But but they would know better, obviously, how it's impacting the climber. And it's, you know, all the mountains I work on around the world that are, are changing uh, quite dramatically now, the, the glaciers. Uh, and, you know, to give a concrete example, Garrett, of, of, you know, routes coming into shape or out of shape on Everest, uh, you know, the, the west ridge of Everest, classic route that was climbed as part of the 63 American expedition, the, such a famous expedition that put the first Americans on top of Everest. A part of that expedition established the West Ridge route. And, you know, in 2012, when I was there, a, a number of good friends of mine, extremely good climbers, were trying to uh, repeat that West Ridge route and couldn't even get onto the west shoulder at 25,000 feet, which as difficult as the climbing was in 1963, uh, it was fairly trivial, the technical challenge of getting from the Western Coombe onto the 25,000 foot west shoulder in that picture. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in 2012, the glacier had changed completely. It probably before it was probably a convex shape and now it was a concave sheet of ice uh, prone to rock fall. And so these extremely good climbers couldn't even get to the starting point for that West Ridge route in 2012. So yeah, you, you can see the change going on everywhere. What gets a little bit confusing though is, you know, saying in the, in the Kumbu Icefall, for instance, you know, is it more dangerous because of climate change? Mm. And I smirk a little bit because, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it can get more dangerous. The Kumbu ice falls are already ridiculously dangerous. So it, it, it's, you know, glaciers move by, in a place like that, by, by chunks falling over an ice avalanche. And yeah, they're, they're, they're still doing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. What has the conversation been like within the guiding and climate, uh, client communities uh, if there's like a conservation effort, individual responsibility, because it's it's a huge carbon footprint uh, in that context. Um, and then Jim brought up, yeah, the responsibility of local communities. That kind of brings us back to like um, the Oxlow Foundation, Juniper Fund. Uh, what what has that conversation been like when you know you're looking out at that mountain and it's changing in front of you? Yeah. Well, I mean. You know, certainly, I, I feel like the, the the younger guides that I that I work with have been raised with this awareness, and 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 on a kind of on a 
I guess you'd call it a microscopic basis. You know, we're all trying to lessen our impact and uh, some more than others, but you know, the in individual guide services are, are trying to operate with cleaner vehicles and, uh, and, and less waste, uh, you know, certainly trying to, to, to make a difference on that smaller level but I hate to say it, you know, ours is still a, an industry that, that depends on flying around the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, there's good things about that. We, we bring work via tourism to a lot of places that, that perhaps only had mineral extraction before as, as, as a way to, 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 you know, find jobs. So there's there's a lot of good that comes with spreading tourism around the world, but you you can't deny that you know we're we do have a carbon footprint, and that we that we're you know our our industry is based on travel. Right, right. Uh -huh. And you mentioned in the book, uh, Jen, that. Um, the Nepalese government asks people to haul out uh, waste, correct? Yes. If yeah. they don't, they don't get a deposit back, correct me? It was like yeah, $4,000 yeah, $4, deposit, I think. And uh -huh. I think that was established in 2014, um, where you had to haul down, I think each climber has to haul down eight kilograms of garbage, which is what, around 18 pounds, I think. Um, in order to get their deposit back. And I think, yeah, those were one of the laws that Dave was mentioning earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Responsible, responsible expeditions have, for much longer than 2014, responsible expeditions have been uh, putting the resources into their trip to be able to carry out their garbage, to be able to carry out their oxygen cylinders, you know, it, it just meant allocating a little bit more money to the trip to, to be able to responsibly uh, carry everything off. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, there were less re responsible expeditions and outfitters out there that, that could be leaving a mess at the same time that, that, that everybody else is, is doing their best to, to bring things down and, and operate in a, a modern style. Do you see this problem in any other mountains? This uh, amount of trash piling up, do you see this in Antarctica or is this specifically a Everest uh, thing where it's focused on that because it's so popular? Well, the, the numbers are so different in Antarctica. It's so prohibitively expensive to get down there, so difficult to get down there. And we, uh, the outfitters, you know, and the guide companies down there, we've, we've worked extremely hard to keep it clean. You know, that industry down in the interior of Antarctica climbing there guiding there only came about in the last few years you know we're still finding garbage on everest from you know on the on the south side of everest we're finding the the, the first garbage that was left on everest mm -hmm. which incidentally you know i was always fascinated when i'd find something from the 1950s on mount everest <laughs> souvenirs some sort yeah. Uh, well, but, I, I think we're, we're approaching about eight o'clock. Um, I really enjoyed this evening's uh, conversation. I hope our audience did too. I want to end it with one last question to each of you. Uh, I'm curious to know what you hope the readers will take away from the book, Jen, and any lasting change you hope to see in the grading climbing community overall. Wow. Huh. Um, hmm. I have to think about that for a minute, what I hope people will take away from it. I mean, I hope people will take away from it what resonated for them. Um, and, you know, and I, I feel like we're in a time where there's certainly been a void of leadership. And, and for me, it's just kind of refreshing to remember what uh, informed, responsible, compassionate leadership 
looks like and feels like in an emergency situation um, and what people can do when they come together. Um, so for me, although it, they were two tragic seasons, again, that the book primarily focuses on, it's really a story of hope and that, you know, we all have tectonic forces below the surface of our own lives. And sometimes they can cause great things to form. Um, so I guess that's what I would hope. But, but really, I'm just delighted to hear what, you know, each individual's own takeaway is from the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Dave, do you have any lasting change you hope to see in the greater climate community overall? Well, I, you know, this, this year with COVID, I mean, it, it, it's, it's probably a more profound challenge to the guiding industry, certainly than the, than the earthquake on Everest in 2015, which ended that climbing season in that place, but didn't, didn't have a, a wider effect really. Uh, this is, this is a more challenging time for, for guiding. You know, I haven't done any meaningful guiding all year, not, not since Antarctica in, in January. And uh, so, yeah, it'll be, I, I hope, I hope we'll all be able to get back into the mountains uh, and that guiding will start to return to normal sometime this, this coming year. But yeah, that's the, that's the challenge on the horizon that I can see. And, you know, and I, I again, I think of things in terms of, of guiding, but yeah, even for, for recreational climbing, yes, people have been climbing uh, through this summer, through this year, but, but not, not the way we, we, we haven't had the freedom of the hills <laughs> the, the way we've been so, so lucky in, in past years. So, you know, if, if, if there's something good that comes out of this, it's that, you know, we, we realize how, how great we have had it. Right. Yeah. A refound appreciation for sure. You know, the, the ability to visit these mountains, in in these parts of the world that you know a few generations ago you you couldn't you couldn't even dream of getting to these places and mm -hmm. yeah we i had come along at a, a very lucky lucky point mm -hmm. but yeah i'd love to get back to that <laughs> yeah. wonderful i'll end on that uh Thank you everyone for attending. I do, I do like to have this kind of a tradition. Uh, if you're still with us and want to turn your video on and wave goodbye and say hello real quick to Jen and Dave, uh, you're welcome to do that and stick around for a minute or two. Uh, please, uh, if you haven't already, check out the Juniper Fund, Alex Lowe Foundation, and the Mountaineers. And of course, uh, Shook, up, uh, the book, and be able to read and hear the full story. Sorry, stutter there. Uh, it's, I've read it personally. It's amazing. It's a wonderful uh, book. I'm so excited that Jen and Dave decided to share this story. Um, and uh, I hope you all enjoy it too. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Bye. <laughs> all right. Hope you all have a good night. See you next time, next Mountaineers event. Oh, thank you for the, the two links to the Juniper Fund and Alex Lowe Foundation are uh, there in the chat box uh, for that. And you're welcome to follow up and if you want to make any donations or reach out to them. They also have great Facebook pages uh, as well as the Mountaineers. We have another uh, upcoming event. Soon we'll be announcing our Be Wild uh, speaker series uh, that starts in January. Uh, and then we'll go through all the way through May. So uh, you'll be getting more uh, information from us if you're subscribed to any of our emailing lists. Uh, and if you have any ideas of other events that you'd like to see, please reach out. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, bye. Oh, now I can see people. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, there's friends.
Okay, I'm going to end it. And the recording is available too. If you'd like to ch check back, I'll send that out and share it with everyone. Okay, thank you, Garrett. Thank you. Good night.